Welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY at the City University in Manhattan in New York, uh, where uh, slowly uh, things uh, are opening again, bars, restaurants, and businesses, important businesses, construction. And of course, with lots of question marks, uh, uh, crowds are gathering outside after that long uh, lockdown, but a lot of that without masks, without uh, uh, paying attention perhaps to uh, the distancing, um, but it's understandable after this long, um, long, long time of confinement. Um, but it's full of uh, uncertainties. What will happen? The uh, immunity is about 1%, one percent, one thinks, of people who have had it. 70% uh, is needed for herd immunity. And uh, there are uh, uh, many signs from countries that reopen that numbers are going up, uh, even uh, in America, even so some politicians say, no, it's just because it's testing. Pence said that yesterday, the vice president, but um, there are indications now that this is uh, still, we are not over it, uh, but on the other hand, life in a way has to continue. Theater, of course, is suffering. There is no end in sight. Um, for the end of the year uh, and also next spring, we do not know what will happen worldwide as we hear uh, in France uh, uh, or Italy, very in Germany, uh, spaces open up slowly with 10%, 20%, 30% of audiences, lots of outside work, but um, um, we do not know what theater uh, will be like, look like, uh, what we can do and what not. So many, many, many artists, especially in America, are out of work. It's not a great system. It's compared to many of what we hear online. It's actually devastating. No Ministry of Culture, no support. Eight, nine months ahead, everything canceled for musicians, dancers, theater makers, performers. And uh, traditional uh, revenue incomes like working in bars and restaurants also don't don't work. So we really uh, are still in a, a moment of, um, of great, great uncertainty. And uh, we need to find out as uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, who was on our program, the Pilafa said, what is the value of the value of human life? When does one take into account uh, that there will be casualties when not? And uh, so um, we, we really do not know, but we heard very, very encouraging, moving and significant contributions from theater makers around the world, around the globe. We have now over 90 artists almost who were involved in our singing talks. And today we come to an important part of the world, Asia. Um, play we, at least in Europe and America, do not know about. Uh, it's uh, not as much on our radar as it should be, uh, all that uh, energy, innovation, tradition, long, long tradition, and everything, but especially in theater and performance, dance and puppetry. So uh, today uh, we have two representatives who have uh, tipped their toes into the New York scene a little bit, Govan Rubin, hi Govan, and uh, uh, Terence Conrad uh, from uh, Terry and the Cuz, uh, the company that somehow is a bit, uh, it will tell about moving between Australia and Malaysia. And um, they are part of our, our uh, international lineup today. Yesterday, we had the great uh, Peter Schumann from the Bread and Puppet Theater with us, who's in Vermont. Normally 80, 90 people are on the farm. They are six or seven now, and they make small performances in the forest. Once they use 20, 30,000 people would come to their, to their uh, uh, shows. Tomorrow, we have uh, Tanya Bruguera from Cuba, the significant an important uh, artist, a theater artist, performance artist, socially engaged artist um, who defines activism and art and the space in between uh, as the most significant what we can do. Also things you can't sell, you can't buy, but it makes a difference in the life of people and how to integrate meaning. We have Hope Azida from Rwanda on Thursday who will tell us about the situation in a country that has survived terrible, terrible times, uh, civil wars, atrocities genocide, and now uh, Corona is there. What does it mean for a theater maker? And Saman Amini, a theater artist born in Iran, moved to the Netherlands and uh, created work there. And um, it will tell us a, a bit about that reality. But now we really focus on uh, Malaysia, on uh, Govan and Karen. So first of all, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, to spend with us. Uh, what time is it? It doesn't look like uh, noon. Well, it's uh, 12, uh, p uh, well, 12 a.m. now, uh, so it's uh, basically uh, uh, Wednesday morning uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, we, we should be fast asleep, but we stayed up for this talk. Yeah. 
Thanks for having us, by the way. Especially uh, after, you know, it was such a great lineup of Peter Schumann, Tanya, uh, Hope Azeda. And, you know, we, we, we felt like the, we had odd ones out. So we thought we'd better stay up for this. Yeah, no, no. <clears throat> it is uh, significant, you know, for us to know about what perhaps is a little bit more unknown. Uh, um, I think once it used to be Eastern Europe, theater in Poland and Hungary and uh, or Romania. Now we know a little bit more. Worlds have come closer together. But now I think it is also Asia that is uh, perhaps a bit more and should be more um, uh, on our radar. It is in the continent, of course, of, of, the, of the future and the work. And also an incredible, great, great uh, tradition. And uh, Hans Thies Lehmann, who wrote the great post-traumatic theater book, you know, uh, when it came to, to Asia, they said, that's great. Yeah, there has always been like this. We have puppets and movements, sounds, words next to each other. You know, that's uh, great that Europe is catching up, you know, on what we are doing, but good to have it written down in a book form. So you guys, tell us a little bit um, before we come to your work, um, are you in confinement? Are you in lockdown? What is the situation in Malaysia when you go out tomorrow morning on the street? Well, um, Malaysia has opened up. Um, so we, we started the lockdown on the 18th of March and it was a pro, you know, sort of full proper lockdown. You could not travel uh, five kilometers away from where your residential address was. Uh, this lockdown, there were four major stages. Um, each stage was about two to four weeks, depending on which stage it was. Um, and uh, it was pretty harsh, so there was no interstate travel, there was only certain supermarkets you could go to, and um, uh, everything was shut, of course. And, um, and then what happened is, um, as of the 1st of June, things started opening up a bit. Um, and then um, now, basically, the sort of a, what they call a conditional movement control order, where things have opened so you can go to restaurants you can go to cafes um, but everything is operated at a sort of 50 percent capacity the sort of social distancing guidelines and um and and you know um and so the only sort of things that are sort of still shut are you know sort of massage parlors and theaters so it's a great company theater uh, finds itself in i think also by our polish friends as that that tia warsawa that the government made sure to write in one sentence massage salons and theaters will be the first one to close <laughs> and the last one uh, to to open and um, and both provide really great excitement and enjoyment for everyone yeah. and relief and yeah. stress and all of that yeah. yeah but there's a connection it's about the body and um what is a so physical it, massage what is a mental massage yeah <laughs> yeah that that is um, that is true. So in France, uh, people had to print out permits. In Italy, you could only go from your home to the next supermarket. So even five kilometers seemed to be pretty liberal. Did it work? How is the situation? How many infections and death? Well, today, well, we initially, when we started it on March 18th, we were... Can you come a little closer so we don't hear someone? Started, we, had, we had about 200 infections almost a day and around 150 to 200 infections a day. Mm -hmm. And the... Uh, they started reducing the conditions and liberating uh, for, for people to go out more once it started dropping below 100. As of today, over the last week, we've had between 5 to 11 cases a day. Really? And, yeah, and, uh, and it's been very well monitored and controlled until today. And yeah, so most businesses are back, but there's still um, everything's operating at 50%. Wherever you go, you need to register. Every business needs to take your temperature, get your, uh, your, your, if you walk into a restaurant, you walk into a supermarket, you walk into, to get your haircut, they need to take all your details. Uh, they make they sure. take your temperature if you go into a business? Yes, they go. So they have a heat sensor in the, at the um, entrance. Yes, yeah. some places even take your photograph together with your temperature, while some places just take your, your details and your, and your with, with your With your national ID number. So this is like an Orson Welles' sort of wet dream. So every, for the, everybody, there's information about everyone that's recorded down who's going where. So this will help with the tracking. If in case there's a new case, they can literally identify where the cluster starts. And who is exposed to it. So, it, it's, so they will be able to track and, and quarantine people in case there's a new cluster. So that's what they've been doing. And so far, it's been working very well for us. Hmm. So that's, uh, that's quite uh, stunning. So kind of Orwellian uh, surveillance uh, state where the human is uh, like 
almost like made yeah. of glass. You can see everything, what he or she does, where you go, what you do, and it's controlled, can be traced. One That's a scary again. thing, right? To control something like this, they had to, res they had to resort to such draconian uh, system, yeah. which, we, which we would never allow, but, but it has reduced the number of, it has succeeded yeah. in the cases. It succeeded, yeah. Yeah, as of today, we had the highest number of recovery. There are more people recovered than there, and there's only a few hundred people. There's only 200 people recovering from it, and there's only been 11 cases today. So, yeah, it is a success story, even though we may not agree with the method, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite, what, what a situation. Yeah. It's a, a, such a li living in contradictions. Um, so, you can now go out uh, with masks whenever you want and drive around. Uh, <clears throat> so tell us a little bit for theater artists um, in Malaysia. What did uh, COVID mean? Did you get support? Uh, did shows go on? Did rehearsals go on? What what's what's what, what is what? So the theater industry, um, like I said, together with the massage industry, has come to a complete halt. <laughs> um, you know, which is which is which is. Which, you know, it's, it's quite shocking and tragic. Um, and, you know, and, and, and prior to that, the arts, um, you know, if you look at it from a Malaysian sense, um, it, you know, the arts contributed to about, you know, 11.2 uh, uh, sort of billion to the national economy, which is about 2% of the economy of KL. Incredible. Yeah. It's yeah. a super and, high you know, number. Yeah, and it, and it sort of provided about 86,000 jobs or so. And this was a survey done by an organization here in Malaysia. And um, when everything shut, you know, obviously um, some venues are, you know, still sort of trying to support the staff, but almost 70% of arts practitioners have lost their jobs. Um, and in a place like Malaysia, where, um, you know, until very recently, there hadn't been too much sort of grant support or um, support from the government, and this has changed in the last few years, where um, slowly the arts have been recognized as a formal industry and people have been sort of putting money towards the arts. Not much, but it is a start. Um, so the thing is, a lot of the theaters, a lot of the venues, a lot of the artists, so this was all kind of sort of a very capitalistic sort of function in how things went about. So, you know, restaurants that function within theaters would support the performance of ticket sales, you get corporate sponsors. So that's kind of how it sort of sustained itself for the longest time. And because of the pretty much the uh, complete halt of any sort of performances, um, these incomes have not been able to flow. And therefore, um, of course, you know, people have literally just stopped and have been living off savings. There have been lots of initiatives um, that have appealed to the government to now kind of try and support artists. The Malaysian government has come up with a couple of schemes to sort of help not artists, but to help sort of Malaysians to kind of cope with what's happening. And I think, you know, the artists are sort of lumped with everybody else. And, um, um, and, and so this is sort of what's been happening um, uh, to the art in general. Um, yeah, so it is a pretty dire situation. Um, I think um, obviously everybody is still looking to see how uh, we come out of this. And, and also you know, it'll be very interesting to see how many companies actually survive or you know, you know, be able to start again. Um, and some companies have started running online donations and online funding campaigns to sort of help sustain their venues. You know, they've had buy a seat program and people have been supporting, but you know, it, it's, it's nothing compared to uh, what is actually affecting the entire industry, um, you know, at, at this particular stage. Mm. So um, are, at the moment, are there any theater performances? Is anything going on you're aware of? Nothing. There's no <clears throat> One of the main uh, rules of this uh, of this control movement control order, which they've done recently, is that uh, there's still no no gatherings of people above twenty, which is still not allowed. Uh, they've not they've only begin and uh, religion is a big part in, in Malaysia, so even uh, religious places are now only being opened. 
So no theater, no performances, no entertainment outlets, nothing, complete zero still. So you can't go to the church, you can't go to the mosque, you can't go to the temple. So everything is sort of, you know, any, any places where you can gather is still pretty much shut. Um, and so that's kind of what's happening. Of course, um, I think a lot of artists have sort of responded and taken some programs online and have been kind of performing uh, and creating online content and sort of diversifying and kind of adapting. But, um, you, know, I, I, you know, we can't speak for how successful that has been in terms of financial re re uh, remuneration. Um, so yeah, it, it is a very, you know, sort of, a, it, it is a hard time for most artists in Malaysia. And, and therefore, um, you know, and, but the good thing is, and, and this is the one sort of, I think, I don't know if you can say or you can call it positive, but because um, this has sort of become uh, this point where suddenly everybody um, can see the flaws in the system. Everybody can suddenly point out that, oh, look, this isn't working. We've contributed this much, but there haven't been any formal support. And we've been doing all of this with corporate private support and but yet we are contributing this much to GDP. And so therefore, for the first time in a long time, there has actually been very open discussions from the industry personnel and members of the government, like right to the top. So uh, very recently, there was a meeting with the Ministry of Finance and Arts Practitioners, something that was almost unheard of five, six, seven years ago. So this was, um, uh, you know, imagine a group of artists being able to sit down with the Secretary of Treasury of America and sit down and go like, we need art mm. funding. And therefore, um, I think what this has pointed out is a significant lack or gap in, in the support for the arts. And, and therefore, the government have now heard, you know, um, and, and, and have seen where these, these gaps are. What becomes of it, we don't know. But it is a start in kind of pointing out, look, this is the areas in which we need support. And these are the numbers to prove how much the arts in Malaysia, and the arts in Malaysia is not just performances, it's crafts, it's handicrafts, it, it's sort of- Traditional performances. Artisanal products. And, you know, so, so it, it, it is a huge range that actually contributes to the cultural economy of the country. And it also sort of puts us in this sort of unique sort of um, place where, um, you know, we are a tourist destination. And I think when people come, the art, you know, whether it's through song, whether it's through traditional form of dance and, um, uh, and performances, that there are lots of cultural shows that happen. Um, and also, you know, the contemporary theatre scene. But I think the, the tourism industry has really suffered from this. And we do make a lot of money from tourism uh, as artists and a lot of artists um, actually uh, um, a kind of contribute to that sector. Um, and I think these are now gaps where the government have started to look at and, and hopefully something positive happens post, you know, Corona. So another interesting thing in Malaysia is also that um, just before the coronavirus pandemic spread um, to this part of the world, uh, there, was the uh, there was a new government installed in Malaysia which is within a couple of weeks of being installed, they had to deal with this. So uh, they never really got to actually get comfortable within their, their role and they had to deal with this pandemic, which they have done, like I said, um, magnificently well compared to a lot of countries around the world. But seeing that when they came in, that they started seeing that a lot of people lost jobs, um, they, a lot of industries had to shut, they and people, they had to hear from each and every industry. And that gave uh, a very unique meeting, as Govind was saying, between the arts pr practitioners of Malaysia and the Minister of Finance and STEAM. And he got to hear firsthand from the arts practitioners on how, how they have, been, have, have had their income totally decimated by this pandemic how um, people, theatre, uh, people who own theatres uh, uh, had couldn't continue to manage these theatres, couldn't afford to make their rental, pay their staff, electricity bills, basic stuff like that, because they couldn't get any seats, couldn't get their seats filled. So this is a very unique opportunity, which was afforded to the arts uh, uh, sector in Malaysia by the thing. And they got to hear and not only talk about uh, 
Malaysia, I mean, sustaining through, through this COVID pandemic, but also beyond, which is a very, which is a conversation which we rarely get because in, in Asian countries and especially in Malaysia, what a lot of when people talk about the arts, they usually refer to traditional arts, not contemporary arts, even though we have a burgeoning contemporary arts scene. And a lot of government funding grants goes towards the preservation of traditional arts, traditional artists, traditional performances. And in this, during this time, a lot of contemporary artists, and they are a lot, got to voice out on their needs, on how they, on, on sustainability and also growing after the COVID pandemic of the contemporary arts team. So that was an opportunity which would, I doubt would have arose, wouldn't, would have never arose if, if COVID pandemic had not taken place. So there was a unique situation which came about also. Incredible, incredible to hear that you'd used the word magnificent, uh, how your government reacted um, here in America, of course, is a devastating thing, the richest country in the world is not able to do uh, what Malaysia um, <clears throat> is achieving. Of course, different circumstances, you know, five million people take a New York subway every day and all of it, but still, you know, it's just stunning um, to see how forms of government really make a difference. And the same is also for theater, forms of theater, the way it's produced, supported, also produces results that are different. We are looking at, you know, what, what contribution theater makes and what works and how, um, it should go on for you as theater artists. How did you <clears throat> experience this time of um, of lockdown? What did you do? How what did, how how did you deal with it? Well, I think um, you know you when it comes it. to we we in a very very unique situation, Frank. Um, in, in a sense, and I know this sounds funny and a bit uh, insane, but so we we like to call ourselves storytellers, right? And, and, and we told stories and that's how we started. And, you know, like most stories, most of it start in comedy. And, and so that was how we started 10 years ago. We, we made comedy and, and, and we, we started doing quite well. And, um, and, and very soon there was lots of companies that basically said, could you do something for our Christmas party or do you, you know, can you do these big dinners and whatever not? And, you know, whilst we never put our name to that formally, those were sort of projects that they call corporate projects that then paid you a significant amount of money that then sustained you to do your art projects. And for a lot of companies in Malaysia, that's kind of how it's always been sustained. Um, but um, one of the things that happened with one big project that we did very early on, uh, Terry very brilliantly said, we should use the profits to start an industrial laundry. Um, and so we actually started an industrial laundry. So as a company, we, 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 we sort of wash clothes for hospitals, hotels, and gyms. And, and that business sort of grew um, over the years. It's a pretty simple business. Dirty clothes come in, we wash, dry, and iron, and send it back out. And we got to make our art while the money just kept rolling. And so because we did that, and that business was sort of basically how our debauchery was sort of funded. We got to do whatever we wanted to do and try out whatever we want to try. And, um, and you know, so we, we made the- And you ended up at the public theater in New York, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. We ended up at the public in New York. Pretty but, funny story. But, but it also meant that because we never relied on government funding and because we, we never relied on, on sponsorship or any of those capitalistic measures to sustain ourselves, um, it, it just allowed us to kind of try new ideas, create new things. And, um, and funnily enough, when the COVID, so I don't mean to laugh, but when the COVID crisis hit, because we are washing for hospitals, we became essential services. So the government paid us promptly. I mean, we lost some business on the gyms and the hotels. But essentially, we were sustained because we washed for about eight or nine hospitals across the country. And so we've been going to work every day and this period. Um, and so one of the things we also, as a company, um, we were also we also very lucky because a few years ago, our big break sort of came when we had an idea for a project and we managed to get into the Pitch New Works at ISPA, which is the International Society for the Performing Arts. That's how I know Rachel. And through that network, I guess, our North American 
uh, uh, sort of exposure grew. Um, Tell about the project. Tell us a little bit about that project. So that project was called Skin. Um, it was a work about um, true stories based around human trafficking. Um, and that project uh, we, we, we made in collaboration with a human rights organization in Malaysia called Tanaga Nita and an Australian artist, Ashley Dyer. Um, because there was, a, there was a huge, I mean, you know, this is 2015, 2016, and it's still the case, but um, Malaysia has a huge number of migrants, uh, foreign migrants who are a big part of our workforce, and a lot of them are undocumented. And therefore, we, we never realized how many undocumented migrants there were until, you know, a couple of really unique situations pointed it out. And then we started to dig in a bit more and we spent two years researching the subject. So the final work um, was essentially a sort of work where an audience sort of gets processed. We take their names, we, uh, they sign a sort of um, uh, a, 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 waiver. a waiver, a liability waiver. They hand over their phones, their wallets. Um, they fill in a questionnaire, they get weighed, they get you know, sort of tested. Uh, they do a physical test, they come in, they, we do an interview with them and we decide if they're good enough to watch the show. And then some people don't get to watch the show. Some people get to watch the show, but they get to watch it in sort of very different ways. And then everybody gets huddled into a shipping container and they see this sort of work in contemporary dance happen between two shipping containers. So, you know, um, uh, lined up side by side and halfway through the piece, one of the shipping containers start to move and half the audience get dropped off in a different part of the city. We traffic half the audience. And, uh, and they have to find their way back with no ID, no money, no cash, while the other half of the audience gets treated to sort of champagne, nuts, cheese, and sort of pretzels. Um, but the idea behind the whole thing is to sort of examine the sort of privilege that we have and what happens when we take away control. Um, and then, of course, at the end, all the groups of the audience end, back, end up back at a, a, a sort of um, a post-show gallery space where the human rights organizations that have participated are there and, and people have a conversation about what just happened. And through that, they actually get to learn about, you know, sort of how that experience and how they felt. And then they get to talk to, you know, sort of real refugees, real migrants and kind of go like that, go, well, that was my story. Um, so that was a project we did in 2015. We pitched it at this bar and it's since sort of traveled to like five different cities. Um, in January, we, we had a major breakthrough with it coming to New York, but, you know, um, post-COVID, I don't know how, you know, we're going to do a show where people can sit crammed into a shipping container, but, you know, it's not for any time soon. Um, but, yeah, so I think through, through that network, um, we, we started to sort of grow. And, um, and in January, when we were there, um, one of the things that I said to Terry when we got back, I said, look, we are in a very interesting position of privilege because we run this laundry that basically means we, we don't have to make art to make money. And I do think now that we are at this cusp of actually sort of through ISPA, um, sort of really examining why we're doing what we're doing. So you know, with 2020 being the sort of new decade, um, you know, we've been operating for 10 years and we've got this next 10 years to come. So the main idea was actually that we should take a break from the art because we've got money coming in, we're going to sustain ourselves, but we're going to start to refocus and realign. You know, if we were going to tell this story in New York, how are we going to do it? Where do we refocus and recenter our art making practice? And, you know, as we were doing that and as we were kind of, kind of dropping out of kind of making immediate projects, COVID hit. So it was a very unique uh, experience for us folk during COVID because we had decided in January that we would take a break to focus on creating work and what will define us for the next few years. So we had literally um, uh, turned down work for, for 2020, cancelled projects. Uh, we even turned down a grant to which we would do work in Malaysia because uh, we said that um, our idea is that we didn't want the grant, to, we didn't want to create continue to create work just because we had a grant. We wanted to create work which we would be, which would define Terry and Dekas and define the next decade. So in, in January and February, Govin and I sat down, we started drawing up the projects we would had. And in February, we sat down and every day we were working and then COVID happened. 
And so then, and then for us, it was just, oh, wow, was this like, did, did we, were we clairvoyant in that? So we were literally, during the whole period of COVID, what we did every day almost, we just sat down every day, we went, we worked, we just kept on writing, kept on figuring out stories. But talk, walk us through a day. How would a day look like that in COVID, you go in the morning, you go to your business, and then you say, uh, so a day, how, you get up? And what, how does the day look like? In Malaysia, during, I will tell you how the day looked like because uh, as Gobind told me, we, we, we ran a laundry, so we had permission to go out to, to, to our office every day. So we is, had a letter that allowed us to drive through. Yeah, what time did you go out to the so laundry? We were going to work in about 11 o'clock in the morning, pretty late, and then we will be there for four or five hours. Driving there would be insane because there will be no one on the streets. There was no cars. We would go through two or, two or three police roadblocks, which was meant to deter people from going, from traveling and meeting people. And then uh, we will go to, we will end up there. Literally the streets will be there empty and all you would see is probably ambulances in during the first few days, first few weeks of this COVID pandemic here. And then we will work for about five to six hours, just uh, drawing up structures, talking, talking on what we wanted, uh, like this story, like- this oh, So you went to the laundry business, that's yeah. your art office is there? Yeah, this is on top. We watch and people working and you work yeah, yeah. inside. So we, we, it's a two floor factory and the top floor has sprung floor. So it's a rehearsal space from uh, open space office. So I'll, if, yeah. we, if we do yeah. rehearsals there in normal times, it'll be after five when the laundry staff have gone back, the office staff. And then we move all the, the chairs aside, and it's a big. Um, Many people, did, when we, when the first time we came to New York, and we were in the public and telling everybody about this, nobody believed this until they actually came to Malaysia, and they wanted to visit the laundry and the office. So, yeah. if anybody's watching this, you ever in Malaysia, you're welcome to come visit us. Yeah, 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 you can watch us work, and yeah, you can come. We'll we'll be grateful to meet anyone from all, anywhere in the world who's here and meet new friends. Okay, our but, audience, yeah. it's, let's uh, all go and visit. Uh, quite a yeah, bit. come to Malaysia, we'll take you around. But the main aim of it was that um, we continue to work through it because uh, we you had have already, papers uh, at the wall, you, you yeah, literally storming, and on the you table, you have photos. We, so, we what were, are you thinking about? What were you thinking about? We were, we were using even a monopoly set, you know, the monopoly set has all the different pieces. So, yeah. we, were, we were using that to, to like, okay, with this characters to work on movement, like, we, we use anything we could get our hands on like uh, everyday stuff, you know, and it's okay, we, we need to define each character. So then we were using this to, we drew a room, like the stage on, 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 a, on a huge ping pong table and we were working on movement and all this. So every day it can, it, it can, be, it can be structure, it can be just us working on movement, language. It will last a couple so, hours so until, until, until we got mentally tired. So to answer your question, Frank, at the moment, what we're doing is um, we're, we, we're writing a new play um, and this, uh, this play was uh, basically an idea that we had for quite some time. And uh, recently uh, in New York in January, we, we managed to meet some really interesting commercial producers who saw our work uh, at the public. So, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a potential commercial endeavor that's going to start off Broadway whenever that is. So um, whilst nothing is confirmed or happening or moving forward, we thought we'll just finish up the structure and get going with the script. Can um, we talk about that, what the idea is, or is that too early? Um, well, it's sort of still hush-hush at the okay. moment. But, but I'll give you a gist of what it is. It, it is playing with the audience, um, uh, playing with the audience literally. If, if they hear something and if they see something which are in contrast, which would they believe? So if you were to tell somebody you did something, but they saw somebody else do it, which would they believe more? And it's hearing more powerful than seeing. So it, it, we are playing with a lot of ideas in that sense. We don't want to give away too much. No, but no. The, idea is, the idea is if you hear something first, and then later if you watch it, which is something in contrast, which will stick out in your mind more. And yeah. literally we realized, and we've tried it with people. We actually did it and we realized that it, it depends in it. Whatever you hear or see first sticks with you. So it's a very unique uh, yeah. experience for yeah. people. So long story short, uh, to sum it up maybe in a log line, we, we're basically, uh, it, we're trying to reinvent the whodunit. So it's, it's, it's a murder mystery that um, actually happens to, a, you know, it, it's set in Manhattan. It's about a New York family 
that you know and it's a it's a very diverse cast so it's sort of you know the the, the protagonist white male he's married to you know asian person that is uh, the you know african american cop there's also the mexican housekeeper and and so we, we're basically trying to have a conversation about the american cultural structure but again within a whodunit and to also kind of really complicit the audience into kind of going like what are your sort your of biasness what are your biases from when you see what you see what you hear what you assume so that's you know based on you know which is also sort of a bit about what our show and the public was about which is called made in america it's about this idea of a country that's actually made up of so many subsections of cultures of people and you know and, and you know like even going to new york it's, it's a really fascinating thing for the two of us when we first came there like you know you you take you walk two blocks to the to the to the to, to you know uh, 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 to the north and suddenly you realize it's a whole different suburb it's a whole different community so you know and and everything is so subsection that is very interesting so i think you know um and and you know that's the idea i think the the, 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 the thing which affected us the most is that especially when we came to the first time to new york in america about five years ago yeah 2015 2015 is that uh, a lot of people they don't realize uh, in americans don't realize how much of their culture is is exported throughout the world and how much we people understand from the music to the arts to the poetry to the movies to to even um, even to the politics, to the social dynamics, which we all, we all, we, which we consume on a daily basis, basis, basis through news, through social media, through the newspapers, you know, through through entertainment, and uh, when we get there, it 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 is it, it it really feels to a certain extent, which is quite interesting. It it's it's like heading back to Rome, you know, like like thousands of years ago, you knew Rome was the center, you know, and, you, and everybody knew what Rome was. And when you got there, you go, oh, wow, you know, and that was the kind. So the, this next show also further explores that idea and through, a, through a racial, social perspective on, on what we see, especially from the outside. Because sometimes a lot of people don't get out what, what we see. So we thought, and many people found our views on stuff, especially on the show we did, especially in the, in the show we did in the public. So uh, once that was very, I mean, it was accepted. We thought, oh well, we should continue down this route to explore that. And also, it's it's that also very interesting thing, like Terry was saying, this idea of Rome, where you seek sort of validation, like you know, like you know, like Chris Hemsworth was not really Chris Hemsworth until he did Thor, or you know, Kate Blanchett became Kate Blanchett after Elizabeth, and sort of. So I mean, you know, with all the respect, it's amazing actors in their own right in Australia or Malaysia. I mean, you know wherever they are, but people people come to America to seek fame, fortune, and this idea of the American dream, you know, and I think that's very interesting. Like, it's, it's insane that I know that Rick Perry is the energy secretary, but I don't really know who's the energy person in Malaysia. Mm. Like, you know, like, and, and you know, or, or, or you, you're really upset about Betsy DeVos's education policy, but you kind of go, oh, who's the education minister in Malaysia? But because, you know, we consume so much American news and you know, case in point, and this is something that we said, you know, it's so unfortunate that one African American had to die in Minneapolis and the whole world is protesting. Like if that person, you know, if that happened in Australia or happened in the UK, the impact wouldn't be, but anything that happens in America trickles down to the rest of the world, which is why also there was this insane you know, leap of excitement and hope in 2008 and this sort of great despair in 2016, because I think the rest of the world have this sort of invested idea for America to work. And I don't know why that is, or, but it's been the greatest marketing campaign since the 1950s. Just after World War II, America, through popular culture, it's the same reason we, we shout for Rocky against Ivan Drago. <laughs> it's the same reason we felt like Neil Armstrong was Malaysian. Like, you know, it, it's because America has sold us this idea of a better place, the greatest nation on earth. And, you know, and therefore we sit down and we go, yeah, what are you doing? Like, you know? You know, like, you can't fail. Like, this is the thing. Like, you know, we want to come and, you know, explore or make, you know, or, or do whatever. And, you know, and as, as I said, like, you know, as a company, 
we're not very popular in Malaysia because most of our work are international. But as soon as we do something at the public, not only do we get recognized in Malaysia, but all of a sudden we're important artists in Australia. And, you know, it's like we, we've been doing the same work for the last 10 years, but one project in New York and all of a sudden, like, you know, so it is, it is very interesting why America, um, you know, why America, the, 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 the America succeeding is very important. The America leading is very important. And, and we don't know specifically why that is because we've bought the product. And so we want the product to work. So I think that for us, you know, especially when we sit down and go like, how did we solve this COVID crisis? And, you know, it's just this insane amount. And, you know, and that, and that kind of, you know, um, so I think, I think the idea of this is sort of what that project is about. And we're still kind of kind of developing it. And hopefully we get to show the producers something early next year when we go back there and we go like, this is the white paper, this is the draft script. Um, and then the other project that we're currently working on is the obviously, you know, skin, which we talk, spoken about to so the human trafficking project. And we, we're developing that for a sort of semi-permanent sort of um, installment in New York as well. So these are the two big projects that we're working on. Um, That's interesting, though. You were investigating reality, the class, race, uh, uh, that kind of chimera, the Fata Morgana, as uh, uh, Hannah Arendt said of America. And this kind of uh, imperial uh, uh, cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan supremacy of New York City, you know, that still uh, um, uh, is, the, is the measuring stick. And when you look closer, you know, you say, what's going on here, you know, and... Uh, and maybe you see even clearer from the outside what, think, is, what is there, yeah. I think a great way to look at it, Zanina, when you say the word imperialism, you said you know, for the last hundred years or even thousands of years, uh, victory would be uh, marching your, 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 your troops into, a, into another nation. You know? Today in, a world of, in today's world of capitalism is when your music, when a McDonald's or Starbucks opens up your corner and, and, and you don't know what is the local culture anymore. It, it, that, that's what you said, right? I want to have a coffee in the Starbucks. I want to have a McDonald's burger and you go, it doesn't matter which part of the world you are, that's what you know. Mm. And, that, and that's, where, that's when you know they have conquered the world or conquered you know, a country. Con conquered the mind, I think. You know? yeah. And, yeah, and there's you know, something to, to be said for local culture. I mean, it's a big world and they'll shut the Starbucks next to a traditional coffee shop or tea house. I think there's uh, many, many rooms. But how, how, tell us a little bit about theater. You said we are not so well known here. Tell us a little bit about the theater scene in Kuala Lumpur. How does that look like? How is it organized? Who goes? Yeah. What are the companies? Okay, so, um, so the, the, the thing is Malaysia is a very complex country when it comes to sort of cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of three major racial groups. So um, the Malays, um, they are uh, basically, so the Malays uh, make up about 70% of the population. And then you have the Chinese who are about 26%. Um, uh, sorry, about two, yeah, nineteen uh, percent, and then you've got the Indians who are about six percent, and then you've got sort of like other pockets of races. So again, similarly, the theatre is divided into those sort of language streams as well. So there's Malay theatre, and this is divided between traditional and contemporary. Um, traditional may take up many forms of sort of puppetry to sort of Malay, you know, traditional classic Malay style, Bangsawan theatre, they call it, um, sort of poetry, sort of, um, you know, and also different styles of music. And then there's contemporary Malaysian Malay theatre, which sort of uses a bit of uh, blends between traditional Malay and also sort of contemporary Western theatre and styles or techniques. Uh, and then you've got... Um, traditional Chinese theater, which is sort of anything from Cantonese opera to sort of um, Mandarin plays. Uh, and then also you have Indian classical uh, and sort of Indian contemporary. And then of course, in urban areas like Kuala Lumpur and Penang, uh, there is this sort of uh, pockets of contemporary English theater, um, you know, and, 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 and and when, when I guess anybody comes in to Malaysia, I think that sort of 
to, to tourists, to expats, to sort of the urban communities, the contemporary English theatre is sort of what gets the most sort of eyeballs and whatever not, but that's very um, city specific, urban specific to Kuala Lumpur and also maybe Penang up north, which is the other big city. And then they're sort of little pockets. Um, very recently, um, over the last 10 years, of course, the contemporary scene has started growing. Um, so obviously this, you know, with the internet and so on and so forth and with marketing and then sort of theatre becoming, so what used to happen in the sort of mid 90s, uh, late 80s, mid 90s, um, there were very few full time practitioners. So there were people who would be lawyers during the day and then theatre performers in the evening. And, but over the years, um, it's become more and more a sustainable industry because there's been a growing audience, which as I said earlier, capitalistically sustain the industry. So more and more younger people, um, as, as Malaysia sort of evolved into a, a sort of a more of a, a higher income society, um, uh, more, I guess, younger people could suddenly, you know, perform or act because they've, they've got sort of uh, families to support. And so lots of people so diving into the industry had sort of grown, the industry started to grow, um, theater, uh, Theatre courses started appearing in universities and all of this happened in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s and it sort of grew. So as of now, there's a good about 50 or 60 sort of really interesting contemporary theatre companies um, that occupy the city area and a lot more sort of cultural organisations and, 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 and societies that sort of do classical performances. So that's roughly the diaspora. Um, and then, of course, there are the big venues that then program the smaller companies, and so that is also a business. And and in and since two thousand and eleven, nine or ten, um, Malaysia started its sort of first big international arts festival called the Georgetown Festival, uh, which is in Penang, and so that was started uh, as part of the when Georgetown, which is the city up north was awarded the World Heritage status because it was a heritage site. Um, and with that UNESCO heritage status, they decided to have an arts festival, which actually grew into one of the biggest, most vibrant festivals in the region. And so through that festival, a lot of big names started coming to Malaysia. There was an aspiration for Malaysian artists to be part of that festival because you're looking at people like Royston Abel, people like City Labi, people, people like Akram Khan were coming to that festival and performing. And so suddenly, you know, it was a destination. And because Penang is an island, it was kind of, you know, so and the festival took up the entire month of August. So every August, you know, all of Southeast Asia would sort of come to Penang and suddenly, you know, it was the place to be. And there was a, there was a great excitement and, you know, and the festival celebrated its 10th anniversary last year. And it was going to be another big celebration this year before COVID hit. So, you know, uh, I think um, that's sort of where we're at, you know. So 10 and 20 years ago, it was sort of a part-time industry with a very few key players who were doing it full-time. Now we have an international festival. We, we now have, uh, uh, I guess, a cultural organization that is an arm, a, a government arm that actually got formal funding for the contemporary arts. Um, artists are being sent to arts markets. So, you know, it's a very growing and, you know, burgeoning industry, which has come to a sudden halt um, at a time when it was really growing, really pushing the boundaries, really trying to ask people about, you know, we are here, we are making stuff and we, you know, and, and people are seeing it and we are contributing, we need more support. And that was exactly where it was as an industry, um, as a market. And, and, and you know, and then it's, and, you know, and then obviously, you know, it, it, it sort of stopped. Uh, but as Terry said, I think this stop comes at a very interesting time because now the screaming has gotten louder. Um, people have sort of pointed out, look at what's happened. And I think this new government that has sort of taken over in the last few months are actually, I don't know if they're paying attention or not, but they've taken meetings. 
Mm -hmm. so, that's amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Such a vibrant uh, energy that's so fast, uh, a change towards theater and performance, which is a good sign for any society, you know, when it flourishes, when it is respected, when people go, something is working, enjoying life, celebrating life, joining joyfully in the suffering of others, as we say, why theater is important. Yeah. And, um, and um, so we, we all should go and uh, visit Malaysia, come to the George Trump Festival, see your work and not perhaps just focus on our European uh, um, uh, knowledge of where to go when you want to do theater. Both of you, um, you have, a, I think, a connection to Australia or, and <clears throat> that, that's where you went to school. But tell us, why did you want to do theater? What m moves you? What keeps your motor running? Why theater and not just the laundromat? Well, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I don't think you can be cool laundromat people, um, you know. Uh, but no, I think so. Uh, sort of my personal story is I was doing law, and my mom said, "I'm not paying for a law degree that you're going to half do." So if you want to do art, go to a proper art school. And I went to the Victorian College of the Arts in Melbourne, and so that was kind of where my Australian journey sort of started. Um, but I had met Terry in when yeah. I went to college before going to Australia. And like I said, we're storytellers and we used to tell funny stories to each other all the time. And then suddenly I sort of went to a theater school and, and I, you know, sort of learned a couple of theater tricks. When you want to go to a theater school, you go to Australia? Uh, well, it was cheaper than going to the UK or the US because the Australian... But there's so nothing in Malaysia where you would go or... In well, at that time, there wasn't a... A, a formal course whatsoever. Yeah, at that time. So this was early 2000. Uh, there was nothing which you could go and say, look, I'm going to go study acting or I'm going to go study at this course. There was nothing at that point which, which, uh, which had been formalized in the education system or any universities. Today, there are a lot of uh, universities and colleges which do, which do offer courses in the arts, from directing to writing to acting. But back then, in, in, when, we, when, we, when we finished our O-levels and uh, were coming out of uh, high school, we literally, there were options with either you, you go find a job or you go study it, which is something reputable. Unlike, I mean, unlike that, I had to study to be an accountant. So it was, it was a very, very, to tell, to tell your families and your friends that you wanted to do the arts was literally saying, oh, you're going to be a bum for the rest of your life. Yeah. Literally. So it was a very different mindset back then when we first started. And literally... That, that uh, is not so long ago, right? That is... Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a really funny story. When we first started putting up our shows, I was working uh, literally in, in, in for, this, uh, for this company. And uh, I would every time my boss would sneak out, Govin would be waiting in a cafe downstairs. I will run down, we will start writing scripts and everything. And then he will call me and say, where are you? And I'll say, I was in the washroom, I was out and I'll run back up, go do work. And then I'll come back down within half an hour and continue writing together with him while he pieced the story together. So it was, it was, uh, it was such, and we thought, look, we would start doing the shows. We will do it, we will do it on the weekends and after work. And then literally we ended up at the public theater yeah, seven yeah. years later so you are I, mean, I, I think it turned out we were quite funny so i think that was a good thing and i think uh, you know people started liking what we were putting out but I Some, think... someone did ask me once like how did you get started i said we have no idea we just did something we were passionate about mm -hmm. so yeah it's so funny also serious your work it's a great you know mixture and look at the world of how you represent yeah. the world and how you see it and and i think i think and you know and i think a lot of people uh, sort of really, you know, I, I think I've been on a lot of talks over the last few months, a uh, few weeks actually, about what's going to happen, where things are going to go. And look, I mean, you know, f I mean, I don't know about other artists, but I, if I were to make an educated guess, I think we are going to have around the world some of the best theatre in the next three years. Correct. Because everybody has sat back and started to think and started to, you know, to, to instead of just jumping from script to script, or oh, I did, or oh, I did, they sat back and actually started putting everything down. Um, and also, us, tell us, what did you find thinking? What, what did you, what do you feel? Why do you do theater? What did you find out in these two months of confinement? What is it exactly that went through your mind? A very interesting thing is that people ask us to say, like, how are businesses going to survive? How are theater companies going to survive? How is arts going to survive? 
and Govin and I have always believed this. Art will find a way. And as Govin said, we will see, we strongly believe that, that the best, a lot of good art will start coming out in a couple of months to next year. It, it's a very simple thing is that not everybody may not survive this period, which is true. I mean, if, when I mean survive, I mean economically, whether they can continue to do work. But also through that, a lot of people will find opportunity, smaller artists who have, who, who now have a voice to actually, to actually, they, they will have new audiences listen to them because a lot of older artists have moved on and, you know, couldn't sustain creating work. So it, when, when, when one door closes, another door opens. And, and also just to, just to put, to put things as a sort of example, kind of case study for the thing. One of the things that we did in this two months was actually look at examples in history where something like this have happened, you know, have happened in different sort of industries. And one of the really interesting sort of industries that we look at was the aviation industry. So now in, uh, nine, in nine, after 9-11, there, I mean, it's not obviously a sustained period, but after 9-11, there was a serious kind of change to the aviation industry. Um, all of a sudden people were afraid of flying, um, airline stocks crashed, um, and suddenly going to the airport was a whole new experience. There were metal detectors, there was security checks, you had to go through TSA in America and all of the other little things across the world. And this affected the entire world. So now you're no longer spending 45 minutes in the airport, you're spending three hours. What happened from there is suddenly every airport over the next few years became a shopping haven because people were spending more time in the airport. So retail started opening up. One of the other things that sort of also happened is the budget airline industry. All of a sudden people were flying without baggage, without you know, without food. So the airline industry had to adapt. So, you know, people 10 years on, people were flying more than ever, but you had created a very different kind of consumer. Someone who didn't need any of the frills, someone who, you know, so some airlines went down, some airlines had to do all these tiered economy, whatever, whatever. And some airlines just, you know, was like, you know, Ryanair or EasyJet. So, you know, I think Having baggage became a luxury, so you didn't have to go through checks. So we, what, what it did is it afforded opportunities for budget airlines, and so a lot of things changed overnight. And I think so. I think you know, looking at that case study, it was a very interesting thing because it, it, you know, so whilst this may seem like a dark and gloomy period, actually, it is a very exciting period of what art might look like in a few months. And I think we've spent a few years and, you know, I think we've spent the last few months really thinking about, well, if we do this show or any type of work from here on in, like, what are we missing? What is the new consumer going to be like? Now my dad knows how to watch things on his phone. He never knew how to do that. But now he watches YouTube videos and online streaming things like nothing. So you, you've got a new consumer that you've got to compete with. Like, why should I come out and pay $60 for something that, you know, I can watch Netflix at home. So there are lots of these new questions which are coming up and there are lots of grants that are coming up from different countries about digitizing, making things more, whatever, which are all very responsive. But I think a lot of artists, some have jumped onto that opportunity. Some have started using that to kind of create online archives or whatever not. But one of the things that we also firmly believe in is that there is nothing like live theater as well, you know, which is, you know, if you look at the airline industry, the big people still want to fly, people still want to fly in luxury and there's nothing like sitting in business class or whatever you want to call it, you know, so in that thing, you know, like, you know, no, no, you know, no online thing is going to beat seeing Pavarotti sing live or, you know, no, virtual picture is going to be like seeing a Picasso in front of you or, you know, no sort of online video is going to look like a Pina Bausch company dance, you know, and therefore I think people are always going to go to live events, but what we're going to have to deal with is like a whole strata of society who have now become consumers of content and that nevertheless, you know, you're looking at somebody's got to create that content and that is the artist. So, there's going to be a whole lot of new content, a whole lot of new artists creating newer kinds of works. That means the older, more established artists or whatever not are going to have to look at that 
and kind of go not top that or whatever, but kind of respond to that and adapt to actually, you know, which is what is so exciting about, you know, when they find the vaccine or whenever that is, and, you know, we can all go out without a mask and make out again. Um, you know, that is what is, you know, so exciting for us. And we feeling that, okay, do we want to be part of that excitement or not? So let's sit down and make the most exciting show to, I, to be able to- Why do you, to come back to that question, why do you do theater? Why do you, why do you do it? What's your goal? Why do you do it? Do you want to think and answer this? Let's go for it. Okay. Well, um, so our, as I said, like, we like to tell stories and we found out and, you know, and, and my background is I, I graduated as a production designer. So I do lighting and set design. And I guess the key principle of set and lighting design is, you know, it's sort of how you, how do you, you know, you're, you're designing the viewing hearing experience for the audience. And because we started with that, you know, you know, and when I sort of spoke about conceptual ideas, which I always came from a design point of view and that design point of view really meant if we want to tell stories right in the middle is who we're telling the story to, which is the audience. And when the audience wants to hear a story, you does, you know, genre doesn't matter. It, it can be art, it can be theater, it can be song, it can be dance, and, and it can be how you place them, where you place them, whether in a shipping container or in the middle of a cafe or in a bar or in a black box theater. And I think that became the most exciting thing because what we were creating or what we like creating and what we will always create is what we call active theater. Um, that's a term that we coined, but essentially what it means is that we want to activate the audience. So you're not passively sitting and watching something, you're actively involved where things happen to you and around you and you're immersed in the story and it's being told in a 360 degree sort of viewing pot. And I think when our audiences come out and they've gone, you know, and they go, I've never seen anything like that, or I've, never heard that story told in that way like I think that's sort of what makes it so much fun and why we do what we do so I think you know and and, and the idea of being able to tell a story honestly and truthfully in a very clever way that's sort of I guess why we do theater you know in the way we do it yeah you can watch a movie you can hear a song but through theater whether it's musical theater dance you can actually get to you get an experience so that is one of the things which I've always found uh, challenging as a, as when you create a work and when the audience responds because they're there, they're seeing you in this creative process and they're experiencing it live. So, and there are moments when you get something so perfect in theatre and you go, wow, it, it's really amazing when you're there for that with your audience. So it, it, it is an experience which is, it's, it's unique and unlike any other form of medium which you can tell a story through. Is, is your political, is it political theater what you do or? Uh, no, I think, well, look, I, I always keep telling them whether it's the work about human trafficking, whether it's the work that questions the form of government. I think, yes, the works have sort of crossed those lines, but we always just call it, you know, we kind of do it through humor. So, you know, whether it's an observation about America, whether, it, whether it's about interviewing you, if you're good enough to watch my show, I think there is, Everything we look at, I think, you know, like some, I think like our favorite art form is stand up comedy. And, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at com comedians like Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle or Jerry Seinfeld, I think there's some really poignant, you know, interesting social observations that if you break it down, it's really interesting political and social commentary. And I think using that, uh, we always feel humor is. This arms. this arms a lot of people, but also because a lot of our work, as I said, because the audience are the center of what we want to create around, it always sort of encapsulate them, their fears, their inhibitions into the project. So, you know, so for something like that to work, you've got to not just appeal to one or two, you've got to kind of actually include everyone in. And I think humor often is the best yeah. way to do that. And I don't think we are political at all. I think we, when we decide on a story, it's because it's a, we think it's a great story and we have a unique way to tell that story. And people can say it's political, they can say it's funny, they can say, but I think it comes down to the heart of our challenge is telling a good story 
and finding a good way to, to a unique way for the audience to experience that story. That has always been our challenge and, and in, in whatever endeavor we, we undertake to speak. That's um, it's a, a quite a quite powerful, you know, if you list look at it closely to say use humor, um, create a story audience enjoy the experience that is as you call an active theater that they are it resonates with them and that you say be independent as you guys do you know work with the governments and try that it happens but uh, uh, um, be independent so you can really do what what you do is in the joke could be you live above your circumstances you know your laundry mat is your circumstance but you live above it but in a good way and yeah. um, and that you um, um, also you know point out that um, uh, in a way, it is an engagement in a world that has a business-related um, 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 side. And the idea of stand-up comedy, which is often interesting because it's an individual experiencing the world in a very individual way. You know, and it gives you a very unique... Very private, often, intimate moment, painful moments. And, uh, but they are funny and they are honest and they are often quite... Quite, uh, quite disastrous stories, and um, but they're and everybody, everybody gets to access it as well. I think that's one of the things which we often pride ourselves on. Like, you know, to be able to that our work is accessible to everyone. To everyone, and that's something you learn from. Also, I think from that multi, and, and uh, just, multi uh, background to community. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, and I was just saying, I think one. I'll tell you one really quick story about accessibility, which is one of my favorite stories. So, when we did Skin. Um, one of the things, you know, was a, it's an insane show for 60 people. We had to close down roads and, you know, we had to talk to the police to block stuff and because there was a truck that was going to drive through the city and so on and so forth with a shipping container. And one of the things, so we tried to, 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 you know, get discounts and wherever we can, because when we first produced the first version, there was no funding and then, you know, we had to put it all together. So um, basically to get the shipping container and the 40 foot container and the truck driver, we had to go to a logistics company that was in a port uh, about 45 minutes outside Kuala Lumpur. And we had to explain to the owner of the port that we wanted his driver, uh, an empty container, um, and we wanted him to come at these particular times and whatever not. And, and, you know, and they did some math and they said it was going to cost 12,000 ringgit, which is about 3000 US dollars for the whole period. And in Malaysia, what you have to do is, you've got to write a check for 50% so that, you know, we gave them a check for 6,000 ringgit. And of course the driver came and, you know, and we did the rehearsals and whatever not. And of course for opening night, we, we invited this guy to come along and he's never been to a theater show in his life. He doesn't speak much English. He speaks Malay and Chinese. He comes with his sort of, uh, his, his wife and they, you know, they sort of dressed up like they're going to the opera because they thought it was this, this, this show that was a theater show and something that the elite upper classes do. And so they came very well dressed. Um, and of course, you know, they were put through the ranks and they had to do the whole thing. And, you know, the wife and him were separated, separated. He had the champagne and the pretzels. She was on the truck and, you know, he saw how his truck was being used. And at the end, after the whole, kind of experience talking to the human rights orgs and whatever not, you know, you know, he, you know, this is the guy who's never seen any theater. You've thrown him into a truck seeing contemporary dance. And he looks at me and he just gives me a, like a thumbs up and he says, oh, very, 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 very good, very good. And then he leaves, um, you know, and then we don't hear from him for about a week. And then I come to the office and one morning and uh, one of the, uh, our admin, admin staff basically says, oh boss, there's a, there's, a, there's an envelope for you and it's from the company and he returned our $6,000 deposit. He said he didn't want to take any money. Hmm. So he said he was like, yeah, yeah. And he, there was a little note saying, thank you very much, no need money. And he returned our check. So, you know, so, you know, again, you know, something must have happened for yeah. this person to be able to access that production. And for him, you know, a businessman, never been to the theater to, to hand back a check yeah. And said, and literally, uh, thank you very much. No need money. That was his note. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, we sat there and you know that that was better than any newspaper review. That was better than any Facebook post. That was better than any kind of thing. Because I sat there and went, you know, this is something that you can do. And you know, and, and I think for a long time, I think the arts often um, sometimes, you know, they 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 fail fail to include and they 
fail to give access and you know and, and it's all about the exclusivity and who goes where and you know whether you perform this venue or that venue and so on and so forth but i think at the end of the day it comes back down to the audience and the people that you actually want to connect with uh, and the people you want to tell these stories to uh, and i think as long as you've got good stories people will want to hear it in whichever way or form which is why i think the arts will survive and i think that's going to be you know, it's going to be a pretty exciting few years. What a great, uh, great, uh, a great story. Also, the idea that you define the driver and the company as your audience, that you want them involved, that they understood what you did. And it was about human trafficking. This was a serious, a serious work. And as you said, with modern dance, I saw a bit of the, the video uh, conceptual modern dance with it. So this is, um, it is a really uh, a stunning, like Peter Schumann yesterday, who said, we did our shows in the early 60s in Spanish. We performed on the streets. Uh, Puerto Rican kids had to go to Vietnam War. The mothers asked us, they commissioned him to write a play or to do something because they saw them. And he said that letter was said, you know, we regret to inform you. The mothers got those letters that their sons had died. And I said, we of course did it also at interpreters. That was our audience and nobody cared about that and that why it says the show they did most uh, the most significant one they ever he felt perhaps they they ever did and by the way interesting that laundry and bed sheets and hospital he said he got uh, uh i don't know if you saw it he got uh, yeah, from, from the back. old host, yeah, yeah from the old, old hotel that broke down and now he's painting on the bed sheets that were uh, most probably yeah. came out of uh, some laundry so there is some connection to uh, uh, uh that whole uh covid experience we're having <laughs> we are having here thank you guys really i know we just scratched the surface but i think this is important work what you do there's an important culture and i think something produces the mixture of it and the mixture of western influences us and european but your own traditions your thinking your new approach to it and being trained in australia so this is exciting and great in the world should pay attention rachel cooper said from the asia side you have the hey hats this world has to be represented. It is such a big part, and she's so very right. And I'm glad we, we have you have you here with us. And um, like world music is significant. Every musician yes. listens to music from the world to make his own music. And we theater people in the we have to do the same that we really have to listen. If we learn anything in the corona time, that it is the time, as you say, to study, to go on the break, to listen. As if Finishing question, um, um, what do you, uh, what do, let's say you guys were just in Australia and the school and the COVID would have happened or the, the people around the world who produce theater, who are engaged in the arts and who are perhaps still in lockdown. Um, so what is your, what is your advice? You know, we spoke to our colleagues in Brazil, you know, this is devastating. This is no money, actual uh, harassment, uh, yeah. censorship, uh, Ministry of Culture has been dismantled almost a million cases now and it's being still denied the government officially says don't count the cases um, what do you say to artists uh, who are engaging in a way the world as you do and say you want to tell stories but wh how should they use this time and what is of importance how should they what does it mean i think it's very important that they continue this fight what is being pushed on them censorship to not to, to continue to tell the story so the rest of us can hear it. That is the job of, that is our jobs, is that to continue to ensure that our stories, our experience get told. And I think to add to every other person out there, whether they're in Brazil, they're in America, you know, through this, going through this, this horrific situation because it has decimated, you know, it has decimated income, it's decimated families, it's friends, you know, and everything so the thing is to be strong and to continue to figure and to continue to keep working no matter what means are available to us to keep writing to keep to keep telling stories to keep to keep it going because that's the only way which which we can because people are confined at home people are confined in you know in, if you if you're suspected of covid you're you're taken to a hospital and you're quarantined you know, so it's a very, very, it's a very, very harsh reality which we all are facing in 2020, and nobody has got the answers. Governments are lost. Some governments are getting it right. Some governments are getting it wrong. You know, and so many organizations are, are fighting to survive. 
So the thing which we keep telling people when, when we talk to artists, to organizations around the world is, is keep, keep fighting, keep telling the stories and we all have got to adapt and nobody has the answer now. We wish we do, but it will, there, will, there will come a time when we all, we all will want to hear the stories because that's what we are, chroniclers. And anyway, if I can add one other thing, which is something that personally happened to me, I think, I think this is also an unprecedented opportunity to actually get to know yourself. You know, when you spend so much time in isolation in your own house, you start to notice, you know, sort of your arm fat down there. You, you start to notice that, oh, you know, this is how your hair grows. And you start to actually f- look at yourself and kind of, you get this opportunity to question everything that you believe in, that you thought you believe in, because there's never been a period of time where you've had such intense investigation of self and why you do what you want to do. And I think if an artist gets to use this time to actually look and, you know, if, if say, for example, your government is doing this and then you're like, why are you upset with that? Like, what is it about what they're doing that really pisses you off? You know, is it just because everybody's pissed off? But why is it that you are pissed off? You know, the, the ability to understand that, to understand why you like you know, using your knife in your left hand instead of your right. And this is a really interesting thing, but you go like, but why is that? And I think the more you can start to understand yourself and why you're responding to things in very particular ways, I think that is going to help you tell more original stories. And also it's going to help you really send out a story from your unique perspective of why these things upset you. And I think if people can latch on to that, then I think you create a movement. You know, I think with the very, very sad case of George Floyd, I think what we saw on that video was basically what we all started the questions. Why are we upset with that? What about that video was so upsetting and that everybody had an individual reaction to that moment. And that individual reaction started a group reaction, which started a national movement, which now started a global movement. So I think this period is about looking at all those moments and never in, I mean, in my lived life, I've never had this opportunity. And, you know, it's not like World War II where, yes, things didn't function, but there were bombs going off everywhere. This is like, everything is quiet. Everything is peaceful. You get, you know, internet, you know, this is, an insane privilege and you get to talk with people more than ever. And I think this is the opportunity the artists to actually take to understand themselves so that they can better tell stories. If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Yeah. And, um, and something to really consider know yourself and get to know yourself, observe, you have your body and you can observe. And then from the, uh, individual experience to your community to your city and then from your country into and to have a global consciousness while acting and working locally so this is a really really um, um, important to hear from you congratulations on your work it's stunning to hear uh, what you do how you do it uh, your story and it's inspiring it's also full of energy and I think uh, also the news from your country that it is dealing so well with it, that the arts are flourishing, that you know, art schools are opening, festivals are happening, and uh, that you do work that you know, the, the established festivals are happy to have in because it is something new that looks at the same in a different way, in a new way, and you found a new form um, in your uh, container play and the idea of the active theater is something you really might think about more or write something, a little um, little little booklet about your work while you're out there. So thank you really, really, really for showing it. It's almost, no, it's past one o'clock. And yes, it, uh, it, is, it is great. I saw some feet on the leg there, so it's, uh, on the bed behind you. So it is sleeping time uh, yeah. in, in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, thank you really, really for, for, for joining us. And for all of you, tomorrow we have the great Tanya Bruguera. You really, something not to miss like today. Um, she will talk about her work in Cuba and why she does the art and, uh, uh, and, and how much trouble it gets her, but also what a real significant effect it has and what an artist actually can do by one single 
uh, artist who started out as an art student at an at a an, at an university and uh, Hope Azeda from Rwanda. I think she's a fantastic and brilliant artist uh, to hear from here and someone Amini from Iran who's in the Netherlands. So um, stay with us this week. Um, it's really a journey around the world uh, and what we take again this week. Thanks for HowlRound at Emerson College for hosting us, uh, Vijay, Thea and Travis, uh, my team, uh, Sanyang and Andy. And to you audience members, I know um, some of you really listening very, very often. Last, last night I had a talk and, um, and uh, people who, who, who say that it also, you know, is a staple of their days, of their weeks, and know they can tune in if they want and they're interested in that. It is so meaningful what you tell uh, the audiences um, about your work and life and, um, and that it is an expression of a new time also we do live in, that we are connected, that we listen to each other, that what you do is important. And, but also listening is of significance. And then as you guys said, you know, change yourself also change in an authentic way and use this time as a way to make the world better. As we know, especially in America, things are not working. The forms are not right. The results are not right. There is a structural problems there here. It is now open, as you guys also said, and um, we know it, but what's important is what do you do with knowledge and uh, we have to do something to change it. So thank you all and um, have a good night. And, uh, uh, and to our audience, I hope you will stay safe, stay tuned and see you again this week or tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Bye-bye.